that we're up to that time, and we hand it off to Jim. Jim's here to tell us about City College's network and our security. So uh, thanks. Uh, as Sam mentioned, I'm the network manager at City College, so it kind of changed my title a little bit over the years. But I've been here about 15 years, and uh, it's a fun place to work. It, you know, a lot of people uh, work here for quite a long time, 20, 25 years. They might complain every day about it, but they stay for 20 years, something like that. But in any case, uh, we have a good group of people. And uh, what I'm going to do is give you an idea of the scale that we face and some of the issues that we face. And I'll be happy to answer questions and kind of fill in gaps as needed. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a rough uh, summary and kind of descending order of the scale. So it, it gets to the point where it's, it's really difficult to kind of keep track of things, especially how many computers at City College. You know, we kind of go online and we find them, but that maybe are only the ones that are turned on. You know, it's, it just gets really difficult. There's two million square feet of space. I probably should have started with that one up at the top. It, it really makes it hard. There are a lot of keys. You know, we don't have access to all the rooms. Uh, so there's places, there are groups of computers that we can't even get to from, you know, the IT department. We have to have doors with inner doors and outer doors. And, you know, it just makes it really challenging. Uh, but in any case, um, get down more into this uh, area, about 2,000 phones or so, uh, a lot of Wi-Fi radios. We still have a lot of fax machines, unfortunately, that even though we don't really want to have, but the organizations that we do business with, um, uh, you know, uh, for financial aid, uh, anything to do with the state of California, for example, they're still relatively fax intensive. CalWorks as an organization. Uh, but there's also kind of talk to it, you know, in some cases, people have their impression it's more secure than email, you know, granted, better than, you know, non secure email because we have, you have a fax there. Uh, but in any case, uh, we still have to kind of support all those. Uh, from the, the cabling standpoint primarily, and they use part of the phone system. And, and then we have uh, about 190 Ethernet switches uh, spread around the city uh, to provide the connectivity. So we're fortunate enough we have our own fiber network. So in the same way that we connect this building to the library, we go all around the city. So you can see the other campuses here. This is the order. We go through uh, a um, co-location provider for our ISP service. Uh, and then in kind of this order, Evan, Southeast, Downtown, uh, all the centers are connected together via our own private fiber network. So it really makes everything uh, very easy to configure, just set up VLANs uh, across the city. Um, uh, really low latency, it's a millisecond, you know, across the city. Uh, we haven't had many issues at all with it. Fiber is great. You put it in the ground, it just lasts for, for you know, decades. Uh, a few fiber cuts here and there, but uh, nothing that has, has really had a, a major impact. Uh, so this is one of the first projects that I, I took on uh, when I was here, uh, as, long as, as well as a new phone system. So we put in a large voice of IP phone system. Uh, so those two projects alone took uh, about two years to complete. Uh, so our Wi-Fi vendor is Cisco Meraki. Some of you may be familiar with them. We don't have an AP in here, but that's what they look like. Uh, kind of a white uh, box that you'll see in various places. And, um, They've been a really good partner of ours. We started working when they were, uh, before they were purchased by Cisco, uh, when they were just known as Meraki. And uh, they're located here in um, uh, Mission Bay. And so we've been uh, a beta test site for them for a number of years. And it, it's really a good partnership. They donate equipment to us, and then we install it and kind of give them operational feedback. And we don't really even have to do it directly. They can ma manage the systems uh, and, and tell how things are performing. Occasionally, we'll have to get involved and, and do some troubleshooting and things. And occasionally, there's a bug that we actually notice. Uh, but for the most part, it, uh, it's uh, relatively painless for us uh, to put these in. So now we have over 400 uh, Wi-Fi systems across the city. And um, <clears throat> this is a quick a statistics from, I just pulled this. Uh, we have a dashboard that makes it pretty easy. It's cloud-based uh, controller. <clears throat> uh, for the last 30 days, uh, this is pretty typical, 29,000 client devices. Uh, that's pretty consistent every month. Those are unique client devices. So 30,000 per month, about 10,000 per day that we, <clears throat> we deal with. And then um, we have a number of SSIDs. You know, we really try to promote the authenticated login with staff or student. Uh, but just for whatever reason, a lot of people have trouble with it. it no matter what we do, it's a little complicated. Uh, we have a lot of visitors and guests uh, and people that may not know their student ID number or may not want to log in. But in any case, you can see uh, half of our uh, clients actually, 
I guess by usage, this is uh, the usage percentage over here. Uh, but by number of clients, I'll have to pull up that percentage. It's much higher. So you can see 20,000 of them, 20 out of the 30,000. So two thirds don't want to bother, don't want to log in, or they don't know the mapping mechanism, or you know. And, and we've just debated for years what what's the value of it? What are we getting? You know, um, how can we even trace back to a particular uh, person? Um, you know, it's really challenging. It's a very dynamic IP address assignment, as you can imagine, about a one hour lease time. So, you know, we just don't have the sophisticated tools that would determine who had which IP address at, you know, a given point in time three days ago, uh, and, and did they log in, and then can, we can get their student ID number, and then, and then what, <laughs> you know? So <clears throat> we've had very few instances where this has even been needed. Uh, and then so instead what we do, we control as much as we can at the firewall. So, for example, we whenever we want to, I'll show you some examples where we can block malware. We can, um, you know, control. Uh, we have to control peer-to-peer -peer traffic. We can't just let it kind of go uh, on an ongoing basis. So we just manage everything centrally at the firewall. We use Palo Alto Networks firewalls, uh, and so that's working well for us. Um, this is an example of the operating systems. So you can see they're just all you know, bring your own. Uh, definitely a big preference for. Um, uh, smartphones, uh, half of the devices are smartphones uh, on a given month. So that right away is a pretty interesting uh, statistic. Now it doesn't break down the, uh, the model of iPhone as long as they're all, they're all running the same OS. But then you can see, you know, uh, 5,000 uh, Mac OS, so MacBooks, a uh, little less than 10% uh, Windows, uh, Android, um, actually relatively, uh, you know, larger than the, the Windows base. Uh, and then others, we have some older windows and then some other kind of, you know, very few Chromebooks, for example, um, uh, you know, compared to everything else. So, so there's just this large uh, mixture of different devices. And uh, <clears throat> most of these are going to be pretty standardized, I guess, from an iPhone perspective. But we just find a lot of variation in the different devices. Some of it will, the Wi-Fi will work fine, others it doesn't. Uh, we get complaints that hey, Wi-Fi is terrible, and we think it's great when we go test it. So uh, it's just really a, a challenging environment. You know, people are not as concerned about security; they just want to get on. Uh, you know, whatever they want to do, they just want to get on Wi-Fi. We just want to get them on as quickly as possible. We don't want to answer. You know, at, at even a hundred calls a day are going to knock us out, much less you know the ten thousand people that are actually using it. So some interesting things we find, though. So, for example, this is from our, our firewall. <clears throat> we can pull up, um, you know, malware users, the top 10 malware users. Uh, in this case, the top 10 are all Wi-Fi clients. And so we do this with the Palo Alto Networks firewall and the URL filtering option. So we're blocking threats uh, or external, you know, malicious sites. So these are ones that are infected? Yes. They have some type of a uh, problem. Yeah. Uh, they're calling out to malicious sites. Uh, the firewall is detecting malware, mainly because they're outbound communications out to a known uh, problematic site. Um, and Palo Alto maintains the database for that, so we don't have to deal with it. But you know, we're wondering, what, what do we do? When we notice this for our um, employees, if one of them appears on the list, there'd actually be a problem. It's going to have a pretty high count. And in this one, uh, this is just an account for seven days. And some of these Wi-Fi clients had over a thousand outbound URL connections uh, to malicious sites, and they probably weren't on for very long anyway. So you know they could have been on for a couple hours. Um, <clears throat> so the outbound traffic, it's all blocked. Um, you know, so we don't. While they're on our network, there really isn't a um, uh, an active problem, I guess you could say. But once they leave our network and our firewall protection. Now they rise again. So no matter, next place they go is probably not going to have uh, threat blocking like we have. <clears throat> so we don't really know who the people are. Um, but e even just trying to find out, even if we did want to do something to help help them, you know, we'd have to go through like a quarantine process, make sure everybody's antivirus is up to date, uh, all of that before we'd let them onto the Wi-Fi network. And we just really don't see how that would be feasible in our environment. You know, I've heard of those systems at a, a small school. They got 3,000 students or 5,000 students, and it's a four-year school. And maybe they even issued them all a laptop, you know, that kind of thing. But here, to have the, the variety that we have uh, and to try to do anything about it, you know, we just don't think there's a, 
uh, much possibility. Uh, we would like to, some cases we could potentially track them down and notify them, but I guess we just don't see it as quite our, our job and there wouldn't be any end to that. Uh, not sure whether they'd thank us or anything either. But, um, so anyway, just an interesting statistic that we hear there. So when we do look through this report, then I can tell which ranges are our IP clients or our Wi-Fi clients. <clears throat> so then we just kind of disregard those and we move on and look for other, other problems. So this is a big problem, actually, uh, not just for us, but all of the colleges in California, the community colleges, we all have open admission, which is great. It means anyone who applies uh, can get accepted and, in, and enrolled. Uh, and, but the enrollment process actually kicks off a lot of things. You get a, here you get a student ID number within the uh, Banner database, and we also create Gmail accounts. And we send that Gmail, the Gmail address information to whatever personal email that they have entered in the application process. And so <clears throat> what's happening is uh, on the scale of thousands, uh, these accounts are just being opened up by individuals who really just want to get the .edu email address, and then they're being sold. So we have instances of some being sold that are, you know, Gmail name at uh, mail.ccsf.edu, and they're being sold. Uh, some even on eBay uh, was uh, people reported them being sold, and other forums and things like that. And so this is a really big uh, problem. You know, again, tens of thousands uh, of things, and not just California community colleges, but other colleges. And for us, what we're doing is, uh, well, first, this, this central organization, the, the Tech Center, uh, Community College Tech Center, they're working on a solution centrally that can protect everyone. Um, <clears throat> and then what we're also doing here is we're, we're trying to stagger a little bit the time from where you get the Gmail account. So in other words, you actually have to enroll in a class uh, before you would get the Gmail account. Uh, other colleges don't have that option because they use the Gmail account to actually even roll, or sign up and register for class to begin with. So they really don't have that timing option for us to, that we do to try to avoid it. Uh, the other thing is to noticing a lot of the um, country codes are um, you know, outside the US for people that are, are doing this. And so what they're able to do there is we have a separate process for international students. So if you're coming from you know, Russia, Bulgaria, China, Anywhere, um, uh, we have a separate registration process for uh, international students so that they don't necessarily have to go through this. But uh, a large percentage were from country codes or country names that were, uh, you know, not pretty, not real common for our, our students to be coming from. Um, so that's one big problem that we are facing. So here's another one. Uh, the National Institute of Standards has just uh, made this. Uh, information security standard a requirement for colleges and universities. So this is NIST 800-171. I know you don't have heard of that, maybe, but it's... Not 27,000. <clears> they can't be requiring 27,000. No, what I think they're doing is they're, they're saying this one replaces those or in place of those, and NIST includes these types of things. So this is, I think, a firewall uh, type of a uh, standard. Um, <clears throat> And then what they've included, and that's, that's coming into this standard. So this one feeds that. What's being fed here are the um, um, requirements. This is controlled, unclassified information, what we call PII, personally identifiable information. The government calls it CUI. Uh, but what they're doing is taking this document that's pretty detailed uh, and, and very applicable if you're uh, you know, the, uh, a building in the middle of downtown Washington, DC. Uh, one of the things says uh, visitors must be escorted and observed at all times. <laughs> okay, sure. We will, we will have everyone escorting visitors and observing them across the Reese City College campus. Um, <clears throat> is this so, really required? Yeah, it's, this is going to be required for student aid. For organizations that uh, use federal dollars for financial aid, which is all their Pell Grants and you know, other things. So as far as I know, all colleges and universities are going to have to start to meet this particular standard. That so terrible. Yes, yeah, terrible. I know. I agree. How can we do that? I don't know how we can actually do it. Um, so this is an example of uh, some of the requirements when it gets down to access control. A lot of it's based on you know if the SANS top 20 controls. A lot of it's based on that, except there's 110 instead of 20. Um, so uh, so this is some of it. You know, uh, control the flow of, of CUI in accordance, etc. Here's an easy one, you know, limit unsuccessful login attempts, you know, so we do that. But, um, you know, some of these things are just really not going to be 
of something that we can relatively easily control. I, I went through the 110, and I guess about 50% of them appear to be kind of problematic for us. Um, and then like anything else, it kind of depends on, well, who's going to come and verify that we meet this standard? And then what's the implications? You know, obviously, the whole concept of not allowing federal financial aid, uh, that was the reason for maintaining our accreditation and the entire accreditation issue. That wasn't that City College had to close its doors. It's just that you could no longer issue federal financial aid, which is effectively closing your doors if you're an actual college. Uh, so uh, I've been sending this around uh, to various groups within the, uh, uh, the college to get really high level attention at it. I think our chancellor's become aware of this now. Um, financial aid, uh, the dean of financial aid has become aware of it. Our risk manager is aware of it. Uh, but you know, it's going to be kind of be up to us in the uh, IT department to really uh, implement it, you know, as best we can, do the best of our, our ability to do that. So. Uh, so this is where we're going to be spending some time uh, over the next uh, months, years. I'm not sure you, how long it's going to take. Do you date for when this needs to be implemented? No, I, I've heard in fall of 2018, mm -hmm. but which is soon. But now, now I know when they audit the military, they're 90 percent out of compliance with their own rules. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if if they can really expect us to be in compliance with this. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure who the compliance team would be, yeah. but. Um, this is the scale of the accreditation process. Um, you know, if, if you start looking at all the details and kind of the impact across the college, and you have to show evidence that you meet these. So we can limit unsuccessful login attempts. We can show them from our Active Directory a screenshot where we limit that. But some of these are not at all easy to, um, to prove that you're doing. Um, so, you know, this is, again, one of these things. You can't ignore it. I think that's when the real problem is. You go, huh, what, What's, what standard? Or if you say, you know, you give them 100 pages of documentation and say, we've done what we can, you know, I, I believe you're getting much closer to the overall goal <laughs> with that. Um, but someone asked a good question. They said, well, are these just check boxes or is this actually doing some good? And, you know, things like this, our firewall, this is really doing some good. We have, we're pretty aggressive with our firewall. We respond quickly. Uh, if there's a, you know, a botnet, we get notified. Um, Anything like that, we, we react right away. Um, but things like this, uh, yeah, a lot of these are going to be a checkbox. You know, uh, it, it may be an aggregate. There is a benefit. Uh, and of course, from the government perspective or whoever's mandating this, they just say, oh, yes, apply that requirement and you know, problem solved or, or step in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> but reality is it's going to be really a challenge. One of them actually says you, you have to um, allow or have to uh, authorize access to the wire to a wireless network yeah. but again so that's a challenge for us but it's not even taking account that wireless network goes nowhere except the internet you know it's not like you get on the wireless network and you now have access to all the internal resources at the college that isn't the way it is it's simply just getting people on through the internet which most people will call guest wi-fi anyway i wonder if checking that button that says i agree to the terms counts as authorization um it, potentially uh, yeah, it depends how they, how they uh, deal with that. But definitely we are nowhere uh, near a point of being able to trace back even who sat at a certain computer at a certain date time. Uh, you know, there really isn't a tracking mechanism to know that. So this is one thing we do. <clears throat> so you might have uh, noticed the normal Tor operation. Uh, you download the Tor browser, which is based on Firefox. And um, you go to uh, check.torproject.org and it says congratulations. And your IP address is something that comes out of a Tor exit node. Uh, so you're effectively anonymous in terms of your location. But if you try it at City College, you get this uh, secure connection failed. And uh, so it's been this way for some period of time. And uh, so I did a little research back. These are the Tor request logs. So the number of times that we've actually you know, rejected a request. Uh, and there's only like three in the past three months. <laughs> so maybe only three attempts to use it in three months. So once a month, where was one in February, December, November. Um, very few. And um, I can tell they most likely were coming from the, uh, the Wi-Fi network uh, trying to use uh, Tor. And so, uh, so it's just a, the, in a category uh, that we prevent. Um, just, you know, the reason we didn't ask why. So uh, here's our reason. So if you know Dread Pirate Roberts, that uh, 
friendly gentleman who's made history and he's very well known in the cybersecurity circles. Anyway, the whole thing, um, he was actually arrested. He was using the Glen Park uh, Library, which is, you know, pretty close to City College of San Francisco. He could have just as easily been sitting inside our library and we could have been the ones kind of in the, the history books as, as where the Silk Road uh, founder actually operated his dark web uh, network uh, from the City College Library. That, that wouldn't have been very good news for us at all. Uh, so anyway, uh, too close to home, I guess, for that one. But again, we don't see a big demand. If you want to do some research, we're happy to whitelist it for some period of time for a class or two. Um, just tether to your phone, too, if you really want to use Tor. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to, to find ways to get out to the, to the Tor network. And, and it is pretty interesting, I, I think, overall. I've had uh, uh, some groups of people that I've worked with uh, do that in the past, so just to kind of figure out how it works. So here's a problem, though. We, we do have problems, right, sometimes. So here is an internet outage. Um, I don't know if you recall, last September. I'll show you another couple in October. And so I know I, I talked to one of uh, Sam's classes uh, right after this occurred. So right around 9-11 or 9-12, somewhere around there. So our normal internet traffic you know, pushes a gigabit per second during peak time periods. Uh, here we had a, uh, a failure of our redundant firewalls, by the way. Both failed. Um, we finally got it back up, and it failed again. We got it back up, it failed again. Which is, what the heck's going on? Then it stopped. And <clears throat> we, all we'd done is we rebooted the firewalls. Um, we had to do kind of a, a you know, full shutdown of the firewalls, restart them up again. They actually require you unplugging the power. You need to remove the power to really do the full reset of the firewalls. So we said, well, that was a terrible day. We're glad that's not going to happen again. And of course, sure enough, here it happened again. <clears throat> so this time, though, um, this was on October 11th. And so what I did is I went into our traffic management tool. We use this tool called Inmon. Um, or Traffic Sentinel from a company called Imon there here in San Francisco. And uh, so basically I, I was looking through well, what was going on right before the failure. And I saw this, um, this system we call Casper. It's from Jamf. It does Mac updates. So look at the relatively large amount of traffic, right? So we're going around here at 500 meg. All of a sudden there was a, an additional, you know, the traffic pretty much tripled which that alone shouldn't have been that big of a deal. You know, it, it was unusual. <clears throat> but what it helped me do is, is after the, it happened on October 11th, happened again here October 16th. And so two more times, so that's the third time that it happened. And the same symptoms, we reboot the firewalls, what's going on? And in this case, you can clearly see, here's where we, you know, this, this tr system started. So doing Mac updates, um, sending a lot of traffic, completely killed the firewall. And when the firewall finally came back on, it was still going. And then it killed the firewall again. Um, killed both, it kills one firewall, switches to the second one, and kills that one. So effectively knocks out both firewalls. And so basically, after some research and all kinds of other issues and redesigns, what we realized is when you set this to all clients, set to an immediate update, every client gets a 30 gig update package. It isn't like you get a minor little uh, delta update to uh, a Mac OS, it's the entire uh, office suite, for example, uh, that's sent out to these Mac clients. Uh, and uh, 700 of them at once uh, are set to go grab this 30 gig file and, and download it. So that's not a good way to, uh, to set that up. There are uh, mechanisms where you can do policies to where it's some group of, at a time, uh, especially since this is just cached anyway. This isn't like a real-time update that it has to have. It's the, it's the OS package that gets stored on the hard drive until someone comes along and decides to actually install it. So it could go at a crawl. It could take two weeks to get there, and it would still be fine. So in any case, we DDoSed ourselves um, three times. Um, and so it wasn't until I started thinking, well, what the heck is, why is this? And you know, talking with their firewall vendor, it's an, they said, well, something weird, and it uses some non-standard uh, HTTPS, uh, or a non-standard SSL uh, port 8443, as opposed to 443. So they were talking about that. Uh, they were talking about a few other things, and I just started looking at our traffic graphs. And, and this tool only goes back uh, maybe 14 days. So I think on about the 17th or 18th is when I finally narrowed it down to this. I couldn't go back to this date to try to really verify uh, but um, 
you know, it was uh, really eye-opening. I'm glad I found it. Um, but it was really frustrating because we kind of did it to ourselves. And, and it's a real challenge when you deploy apps. You don't really know how exactly they're going to behave, how do they work, what's going to show up in the logs. You, you kind of get a sense maybe of which ports they need. But sometimes, because that'll be somewhere in the documentation, we need port 445, for example. But you really never know what the impact is to these. So we've now learned uh, this is by far the worst um, application. Pretty bad design, for one thing. But we're always looking at like our Oracle database or the storage area network for any kind of traffic burst so we could get, you know, design our network around that. And we didn't anticipate this one, uh, essentially doing a, you know, a thousand-fold increase in traffic. So what, instead of a, a megabit, it's all of a sudden pushing out at 1,000 megabits uh, out of it. And then a random, then it would stop. So based on whatever new package happened to be put there. It wasn't random. Somebody had actually done something that initiated it, but from an outside appearance, it appeared to be random. Mm. So how did you fix it? Well, we've um, <clears throat> totally segmented this now into um, its own uh, network. So it's, it's serving the Macs and the, that serve the labs, for example. So we no longer have any traffic going through the firewall. We simply put the same the server on the same uh, segment of the firewall that the devices are located on. And then we did the same with the admin side. Oh, well, this was not going to the internet. It was going to a server on campus. Yes. Oh. From a server on campus to the nodes on campus, or the nodes were grabbing it. So, and that was the other mistake we made, too. We first put it in the DMZ. We thought, well, this needs to go in the DMZ. Maybe that seems the best design. Maybe people get it from home. I don't know. So anyway, it was putting this huge load through the firewall. Uh, and somehow exposed a bug in the firewall. I think because of a non-standard SSL, maybe because of something else, the way we had it designed, they couldn't replicate it, but uh, I'm pretty confident we could replicate it again here if we tried in our environment. So, uh, and we also bumped up as many of the interfaces as we can to 10 gig. Um, you know, we just can't do them all. It's very relatively expensive, the scale that we're at. Uh, so we just sort of had to really dive into how is this set up, how is it designed, what's it trying to do. So that was frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I always like to talk to people too, kind of general things too, how big is the internet? And so this is a really good uh, series, uh, set of graphs. Uh, the one here on the left is IPv4, and that actually starts in 1989, or June of 1988, I guess, and shows you effectively the, the growth of the internet from a uh, subnet perspective, right? So these are the um, BGP routers that run the internet and the number of networks that are defined. And the networks can range from a slash 8 to a slash 24 in size. Predominantly more towards the smaller end now, the slash 24s. Um, in any case, you can clearly see kind of the first dot .com uh, bust here in uh, 01. Uh, and then now if you look at the growth since then, it's been pretty dramatic. Uh, but again, the submits are getting smaller, so we actually are adding more. Um, but then now, starting in 2003, uh, IPv6 has uh, taken off relatively the same pattern. Um, there was a big bump here in 2011. I think this might have been like World IP IPv6 Day or something like that. Um, and now we're seeing more and more of it as you um, uh, get involved and start looking at the carriers. Um, Comcast and, and different mobile carriers and things like that. If you go out and if you do a, a look up, go to Google and do show my IP from your uh, iPhone, you most likely will see an IPv6 address. Uh, not from us, but if you're out in the ETT or Verizon uh, network. Uh, that's the thing too. We have, um, we have uh, a, what they call a slash 48, which is trillions upon trillions of IPv6 addresses. We don't know quite what to do with them. Um, there doesn't appear to be any real need within our organization for it. We're not about to switch from IPv4 to IPv6 just because. Um, so, you know, what we do is we just enable, you know, if you want to do research or things like that, we just kind of enable it. Um, we don't pay anything for the, uh, for the address space. So it's just kind of something that's interesting to see how, how it's growing, but also just, you know, next time you ask somebody how big is the Internet, you actually have, uh, you know, some reference to that. Uh, so, now the internet's uh, used for all kinds of great things, of course, great capacity out there. So GitHub got hit with this denial of service attack. This was on February 28th. And uh, this was a memcached type of attack, which is relatively new. And I think they got hit, um, they were being protected by Akamai. Uh, so Akamai was able to kind of fend it off. 
Um, I think just a few days after this, um, Arbor Networks, uh, they didn't say who their client was, but there was another attack of 1.7 terabits per second, another denial of service. So, uh, so these are just really phenomenally large um, you know, types of, of attacks that um, you know, are, are a, uh, a, couple year, a year or two ago was Mirai botnet. You might have researched about that a little bit. So we are kind of worried that these, if somebody points one of these at City College, you know, we're toast. Um, we do, we are making some effort to get behind Cloudflare or one of the other providers and get our website hosted. Uh, hopefully by the end of the year we'll, or early next year we'll be hosted on Amazon. Uh, so we can then utilize Amazon. Uh, either, you know, we have to move our whole DNS system as well. Uh, so we'll either do Amazon's DNS, because if we just have the website there, I think they could still do some type of a denial of service attack against just the DNS lookup itself and prevent anyone else from doing a DNS lookup. So we have a lot of entries, uh, a lot of different things with respect to mail forwarding and SPF framework, et cetera. Uh, so we'd have to move all of that into a hosted DNS environment. So it's not a really quick thing to do. It's just something we really a little bit cautious about. We don't really know all the implications of moving it. But uh, clearly, these go, uh, most colleges uh, are, are really vulnerable to this type of a thing. Is there some reason to use Amazon and not uh, Azure? Uh, yeah, we just feel Amazon is um, is a little bit better. That's just kind of the decision made recently amongst the team. Azure is, um, you know, we, we have a Microsoft agreement already, uh, and they are promoting uh, their cloud as, as well. Uh, but it didn't really seem to be anything that was really a reason to drive for that. There's still a cost associated with it. Um, and um, most organizations, colleges, the tools and things seem to be driven more towards Amazon. So to pick one, we, we pick that. Now, granted, we haven't done either one yet, uh, but Amazon seems to be the uh, favorite. Uh, and then for DNS, we would use either Amazon or Cloudflare. We could still potentially use Cloudflare mm. as well. Uh, but things like this are just really hard for us to get, get a change in across the, the whole organization. The website is, is com currently being redesigned, has to be rebuilt. Uh, it's got about 40,000 pages on it. So um, it's, a lot of it's out, to, out of date. We use a content management system that's proprietary uh, from Adobe. Uh, and that's not working out so well. So we want to go to a um, um, open source Drupal. Uh, type solution with content management, but also you know our, our chancellor really wants the website designed you know with the perspective of a student going through the registration process. It's really confusing now. Uh, we want to have you know degree plans kind of mapped out a little bit, uh, various things like that to make it centric, uh, centric around what students need. So it's a very timely uh, undertaking I think to redo the website, and uh, we have a lot of embedded code in the website now. Our previous webmaster did a really good job of adding all kinds of functionality to the website, but now it's a uh, now it's got active code other than just HTML code. It's got, um, um, I think it's uh, SQR, something like that, some kind of scripting, a lot of things associated with it. So, so we have to kind of make it get to the next generation of website. It's been almost 10 years, I think, since we put it up in the current format. Is it also going to be a secure website after it's been redone? Right now it's just an HTTP website? Well, the secure website with a student login is what we call Web4. Okay. So that's going to remain. It's going to be called self-service banner. But that's still going to be the portal for your registration and things like that. So that's a totally different system. The website is going to be meant to have just information. But the one that's just ccsf.edu, it's still going to be without the security um, yeah, there, there may be security, or we can add a certificate to it, but there really isn't going to be any authentication or login directly to that uh, site. We've done some things now with respect to like intranet type function, so people internally can see some more information than people outside can. Um, but yeah, we really don't see, we see there's other systems for, um, for whatever it is you need to do. If you need to register for the health center, make an appointment there, those are going to be other things other than the server, Canvas. Well, I think next month they're going to start. Uh, browsers are going to start marking every insecure, every unencrypted yeah, site correct. as insecure. Uh -huh. so well, even if you're not logged in, yeah. they're going to give you an error message. You won't be able to connect. You'll be able to connect, but it's going to say. It'll pop up an error message to irritate you. Yeah. 
a okay. nasty message saying you're connecting to an insecure site. Well, I have to check. I thought we had a certificate on it. There's not on the main website. I think we no, do. not right now. Yeah. At least not when you first visit it. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, the browsers are getting pretty aggressive uh, with respect to uh, connecting to to different sites. And uh, it's just an HTTP. And just one more question for yeah. incidents response. Um, do you guys use any kind of a management tool? No, we have an incident response plan okay. that we've set up. Uh, we have had in ten years two incidents that I know of. I mean, it really gets down to kind of what you call an incident, right? So the thing where we've had to report a data breach has been twice mm -hmm. in ten years. The most recent one I think was um, April two thousand six sixteen. Uh, so. You know, it's um, we're, we're doing what we can with with all of this, but it doesn't seem like a huge need, I guess. Uh, you know, maybe you know, obviously, if it's a really super high profile incident, um, and if you have frequent things, if you're a really large organization, you need these things. But you know, every time we find a dust up with viruses and stuff, or or a minor little report of a of a misused email, I mean, it just doesn't really seem to reach the category of even an incident. <coughs> It's just an event. And in the case of the firewalls that you mentioned, yes. um, how did you guys get notified of that? Well, it's easy to tell when they're down. We, we, get, we find out right away. Oh. I mean, it was midday, so we know, uh, you know, we either we're at our desk and it stops working or my phone rings off the hook or, you know, we, we definitely find out right away. Okay. A lot of people will call the help desk. Um, and uh, every once in a while we'll get a call of somebody, hey, the internet doesn't work, right? And that's just an isolated something with their desktop maybe. But when things go down like that, we, we definitely know. Uh, the question is, are we, where are we at any given moment, right? Can we rush to it? We really want to be. hours. Yeah, these were during the, during the week, uh, midday, but um, we really want to be in the data center in front of the system. Sometimes at our desk, but we really want to get on the console. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when, it, when it's totally down, too, we have a remote uh, support vendor, but they can't get to it either. So. Um, we thought with having redundant firewalls was really going to prevent the problem, but we didn't anticipate something that would uh, knock out one and then knock out the other after that. So, uh, really strange. A normal firewall failure isn't going to cause a problem at all, just a single failure. Uh, <clears throat> so, this is interesting as well. So, with respect to who is, um, so if you find an IP address so in question, in this case, I was looking up 85.214, et cetera. Uh, you go to Aaron, who is, it's going to just refer you to RIPE. Uh, and so RIPE is one of the other uh, regional internet registries. There's five, as you're probably aware. <clears throat> so if so, you can't just simply say, oh, it's RIPE. So RIPE is its own Aaron, if you will. So you go to the RIPE database uh, and do who is lookup. So they are pretty uh, open uh, about giving you right up front the response from organization and ISP and the abuse contact. Um, they're very, they put it on a yellow banner make it relatively easy to, uh, to find. Um, <clears throat> so the problem, though, is, this is according to Brian Krebs. You might be familiar with him. So uh, the who is lookup function is uh, going to be eliminated in some situations. Um, he's talking about the gen general data protection regulation takes effect May 25th in the European uh, Union. And so he's concerned. Um, you know, he's, this is the core to him. It's the single most useful tool he, that we have right now for tracking down cyber crooks and disrupting operations. So when we see threats, we get threats, we get scanned, we get, you know, things. We are relatively frequently uh, using a WHOIS lookup and, and finding the uh, owner and sending an email, you know, to the abuse uh, email. A lot of times we get a pretty quick response. Yeah, thanks, we'll get right on it. Other times you get ignored. Um, but in any case, I, you know, that tool's going to be gone. Um, and, uh, and I believe this is just uh, for the European Union. Uh, but European, you know, for European Union, if it's covered with, with RIPE, if it coincides with RIPE, it includes all of, uh, you know, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Russia. Uh, so we don't know quite how widespread that it's going to be. But um, uh, this is something new from a legal standpoint. So here's what they call the GDPR. So again, general data protection regulation. Um, and um, so basically, they, they've taken the protection of our privacy. And it sounds great. You know, everybody wants this clear consent required to process data, uh, clear information about processing. 
um, you know, stricter safeguards, all that really sounds good, but then to take away a who is lookup function uh, is, I, I, to a sense, it's protecting the privacy of whoever's behind that IP address, but then if they're doing something malicious, uh, at least you, you don't even have the abuse contact anymore uh, to go to. So uh, I don't know quite what the, the repercussions are going to be of this, but I think from a, you know, a broader perspective, uh, it's, it's going to change things across the security landscape. Um, so, and uh, alternatively, uh, or I should say kind of coinciding at the same time, this is in our Congress at, at the moment, um, something called the Active Cyber Defense Certainty Act. Uh, so this was uh, introduced in October, uh, made it through the first, uh, it was referred to subcommittee. So maybe the general consensus is this really isn't going to go anywhere. Uh, but this is uh, something that, you know, again, you can read through our, our uh, legal process here to find out how these things get developed. Uh, but basically, it, it says that I, a cyber defense was no longer, not a violation. So it's generally, it's a defense to a criminal prosecution that the conduct constituting the offense was an act of cyber defense me measure. So you can say, well, we were protecting our network because there was a threat that came from this location. So we did all kinds of things. We, we, we knocked them offline uh, because they were attacking us. Um, <clears throat> so, and then this, what this does is protect us from any kind of liability. <clears throat> so I downloaded our threat log for the past, uh, you know, two, year and a half, 21,000 uh, threats that are considered like either severe or critical type of threats against the college. 21,000, so 1,000 a month, roughly. Uh, so by doing this, they, we would potentially be able to take some action back against them. However, the who is mechanism is now gone. So we may not even know, and you know, this group, we can imagine Representative Tom Graves, Republican Georgia, he may or may not even be aware that this is passing in Europe and that they're getting rid of the who is function. And so how are we supposed to, not that who is is all that great anyway, you don't want to base your you know, uh, hack uh, or cyber, uh, you know, retaliation against who is look up uh, and and knock out an innocent person. You could be, you know, easily, um, you know, thinking your threat came from Stanford University or somewhere like that. Someone else is, who's been a victim themselves of some type of a crime, and now you take this action back against them when they had nothing to do with it, and so it could just go in this really crazy cycle. Um, but then here's a, 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 an example of, uh, in the UK, uh, they've had this for about a year, what they call their active cyber defense. Now they, they spell defense a little bit different than we do, but anyway, uh, all of these threats kind of come into this threat-o-matic, according to this diagram. <laughs> and um, apparently, uh, from what I'm reading, this is their um, federal organizations are the ones that are taking action to, um, against the threats, and maybe not so much the general public, but that what they've done is authorize uh, you know, federal agencies to do the same thing. So it'll be interesting to see if there is um, how this might change uh, with other things that are, that are going on. It's interesting to see if, if the US might take some action uh, you know, based on what they've done in the UK. Um, but it's, it's just right around the kind of the leading edge of the legal things that are involved in our field. And it's pretty quickly, it's, uh, it gets really complicated. And that, you know, we're really studying all this technology and we're learning all of our protocols and we're learning all of our, you know, we have our scanning tools and vulnerability assessment tools. And then there are all these legal things that completely change that. And they're just at such broad scale and scope. Uh, they're really complicated and hard to, to stay on top of. And then the legal counsel, the legal team, they don't necessarily know the technology very well. Um, so it, we end up in situations like this where, where one hand is preventing the information from being gathered, another hand says, well, you can attack back even though you don't know who it is um, and we'll protect you. So we're kind of in the middle of this big uh, mechanism at the moment, right as these denial of service attacks are getting to be much broader in scope. Um, we don't know, you know, how to really trace back uh, the source of some of these. I think with the Mirai botnet, they were able to trace it back to some individuals in some instances. Uh, but then the source code is out there. 
and these things are all you know relatively widespread uh, around the world. So uh, interesting to see what what uh, goes on with respect to this. So oh, and that that's my last slide. So what I'd like to do is if see if you have any specifics about City College. Uh, you know some of the things that maybe we're facing here. I'll just get up to the kind of the front. This is pretty much kind of an example of what we have to uh, to protect. Um, you know, again, it's PII. Is the uh, student information is what we really have. We don't have intellectual property like uh, a company in Silicon Valley might have. Uh, we don't. Uh, we do have a medical health center, so we do have some medical records uh, that need to be protected. But we just have a large, you know couple large databases. Um, the college community, city co uh, community colleges in California given us some tools to work with. So we all, for example, have uh, access to Tenable, which is a uh, vulnerability measurement tool. Uh, we all have Splunk. We haven't quite had a chance to get it installed yet. It's relatively time consuming from what I understand. That's our big limiting factor with all of these things. Uh, we have Spirian, uh, which can kind of help us find uh, PII, you know, it's, it's a relatively extensive search process, but we're we're concerned that people have been putting files out on various computers around the college and making their workload a little more convenient. But now they've got you know a thousand student records on their laptop, or um, you know a thousand student records in a place that it really isn't a secure computer. So those are kind of the challenging uh, things that we face. Uh, but again, also we don't really have anyone dedicated to just information security. You know, it's a new type, new position, a new role. Uh, I'm still doing the role I was hired to do 15 years ago and still pretty busy with that. So it's really difficult for us to, you know, get justification to hire a new person, to do a new task, uh, to take on a whole new um, initiative. So we are, uh, we being the IT department, we're all kind of working together. Uh, we're really going to try to get more and more support from our business units. You know, they're really going to have to take special care. And they do, you know, they say, hey, we're handling data, the way we do, but, you know, a lot of times they'll have uh, different people access to have, will have permissions to files they don't really need to get to. Um, so they have too much, you know, they don't need all of that. Or if people switch jobs, start in this department, move to that department, they still have permissions from their old department, you know, so it's really hard to kind of keep track of that. A lot of it's just tedious day-to-day uh, -day things, you know, we're not doing anything real, um, super glamorous and I don't know necessarily if the information security field is that way. Um, you know, you're not going to be, um, you know, solving huge problems or, um, you know, finding really monumental scale problems. I think you're going to be doing a lot of tedious things. You look at a lot of log files, uh, try to affect change, try to put a policy in place and then have actual policies that people actually read and take action on. Those are kind of the biggest challenges. You can have a policy that's written, even if you print it out, you'll have a bookshelf full of policies. But how do you get people to actually obey it or pay attention? You have to do electronic, you have to prevent everything electronically. You can't say, don't put data on, uh, don't put data on memory sticks. You know, people are going to put data on their memory sticks. So, um, you know, there's, there's got to be ways that you can find to just to prevent that and, and, and verify and um, stay current. and. Um, Try to get proactive as proactive as you can without, um, without you know, being always in a reactive to reactionary mode. So, so any questions good so far? Yes. A question from uh, our online community from another student. Um, they're asking about Web for password link. If you can talk talk a little bit more about that. Web for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, the Web for password length. Yes. Uh, right now it is uh, six characters, I believe, right. something like that. Uh, and so the Web4 and what we call self-service banner is going to be tied in to the uh, RAM ID system. Uh, so I'm sure some of you have seen that if you're using it for Canvas or, or anything else. Um, so uh, soon the Web4 access is going to be tied into this. As we go to the new version, we're targeting January of next year. So we're going to go to what we call Banner 9 and a new version of the uh, Web4 system. So it will be tied to this, uh, where we have the uh, uh, password requirements that are in here. So it's, it's not really still a very complex password that's required, uh, but this is the system that will be used. Uh, right now you use this for Canvas, for you know, online classes and things like that. 
So it will be used by everyone uh, for the uh, Web4 as well. Yes? Two questions, actually. Um, so one, one observation. Um, on the Wi-Fi uh, page, you not I noticed you, there were four different classifications. I noticed definitely a difference between the guest uh, Wi-Fi and the, the validated one that I go through my uh, log on. Yeah. The, when I log on, the performance is like half, so it's really slow. And for the guest? For the, no, for the guest is faster okay. than, than when I log on. Here in the same, you know, same laptop, same position, it's not like I'm moving around in here. Thing, this semester, the <clears throat> logged in system frequently does not connect, and I have to go to the guest yeah. system to get on. Oh, okay. So I didn't know if there was, if, you know, they were kind of wired together differently? or Well, there is a, uh, we have a, a throttling mechanism. And so the theory was that well, we'll just throttle this, make it a little bit slower, so that this will be faster. So the reverse of what you're seeing, of course. Yes. Okay. But throttling and things like that are those are just like really well known and well, well defined thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know immediately what challenge it is or what it is you're know. facing. It's it just does an authentication through Active Directory yeah. uh, to look up. Um, it's possible it's getting worse. The Active Directory database is getting pretty large now, two hundred thousand. 250,000, something like that. But it's the uh, internet performance after I log on. It's not, has nothing uh, to do with the internet performance. So you get on OK, yeah. and then you try to surf the web. It's slow. Yeah. Well, well, that's five. reverse of the way we said it. So yeah. Yeah, it's supposed <laughs> to be 20, and the other one is 5, right? Yeah. yeah, 20 and 5, but even that, we're just trying to make them both, because then they complain about this. We're really trying to just make them both the same. There's no. Yeah. It's, it's, anyway, it's, that's it's just an observation. But do you it's use strange. like speed tests or anything to kind of measure it, or is it just kind of a feel? Well, a feel you know, we use this Cahoots thing, which just is this online. Just assume class, but they can't do what they need to do. They go to the other system. Yeah. And I'm trying to lecture, and I can't connect to the authenticated one, so I go to the guest one. Yeah. Anyways. Just, just okay. in general. I just yeah, and so those yeah, things are frustrating. Yeah. Like I said, we can go and check it out and not find a problem. And I, know, I think a lot of it may be time of day, but it shouldn't be the capacity of the system either because each of these access points can handle 70. I've seen 70 clients on an access point. Most of them only have 10 or 20 at any given time. So things like that are really tough to pin down. But um, anyway, if you can repeat it somehow, do a repeatable problem, and. <laughs> go through the help desk. If you can do some kind of a screenshot or something, you want to go through the help desk. Yeah, I'd let you know if I can find a repeated problem. It's kind of random. Yeah. That's why I haven't reported it. Yeah. Uh, overall, though, I mean, we, we've had a person that's done nothing but Wi Fi for the last 10 years on our team. And, you know, <laughs> we don't have many people that we can do. We have someone else just for identity management. Um, you know, we have the huge phone system to deal with. So it's really. Uh, a challenging workload. We could we could probably put many more people to work just on Wi-Fi, but to try to pin all these little things down. Yeah. Well, the Meraki is a lot better than the HP. Oh yeah, it's HP a lot better than it ever was. Yeah. So yeah. we've had it now since 2011, I think. Yeah. It's going on seven years. Yeah, six, seven years. And most of the time, I can use it, so it's pretty good. Yeah. So the second question I had was. Um, is the majority of your work and your projects that you work on uh, more student related or uh, campus related with the staff here and all of that? I mean, they, the, the mix of problems and... Yeah, that's a good question. So it's typically, it's been more just, we support the uh, employees and the teachers, so 2,000. And sometimes with part-timers too, uh, maybe 2,800 employees that we assist. Yeah. And those are our customers. Yeah. And now we've got 50,000 students, so it's a different perspective, a different mix. Yeah. Um, but it's really come into play with you know people, obviously with Wi-Fi, a lot of students on, on Wi-Fi, uh, but also just supporting the back-end systems. So as a team, uh, we do support you know all the, the registration systems and things like that. So so that's where a lot of the effort goes. Uh, there's a lot of now things you know with like I said, doing degree planning. Uh, we have to get a new transcript request system in place. Um, so the college as a whole uh, spends more time supporting the student environment, but I would say we as network team specifically, it's been a little more around uh, faculty staff. Oh. Oh, thank you. Sure. Any more? Okay, good. Well, thanks. I hope you guys are enjoying the class here. It seems really interesting. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah. So good. close this out of here.